Hi everyone, my name is Asaf. I work for BrightSource Energy. Uh, BrightSource uh, develops solar fields for thermal solar power plants, as you see over there. We have tens of thousands of mirrors, solar software-controlled mirrors, which uh, concentrate the sunlight over the sunny thing there. And uh, each of these uh, mirrors has an embedded computer on it. Because we have so many mirrors, we have many computers, we want to reduce the cost as much as, much as possible. So these computers are very resource limited, um, especially they have low memory. So we decided not to use dynamic memory rotation or the heap. I will use these terms interchangeably. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna show you some of the problems we come across when you did it and alternative solutions we found to the heap. So, um, okay, what we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about why we use the heap in the first place, uh, in which cases we don't use the heap, because of what problems it causes us, and then we'll see the problems and alternative solutions. What we're not going to talk about is the problem of containers of unknown sizes. Um, this problem is something you always you do in your programs all the time. You don't know how much data you need to process at compile time. So only on run, at runtime because it depends on input or in system state. So you allocate this memory at runtime, dynamic allocation, and you don't allocate everything at compile time. Um, there are alternatives for this uh, without a heap. You have memory pools. Uh, you can use, implement them using free lists. You have allocators which can point to these memory pools. But again, this is not the type of problems I'm going to talk about here. I'm going to talk about everyday design issues or almost everyday design issues which um, sometimes even surprisingly use the heap and how to prevent, how to not use the heap. Okay. Okay. Something is dead here. Okay. Okay. So some terms first. Uh, storage duration. A storage is a range, is a memory area, a range of ad memory addresses, which can be uh, Read, read from and written to. Uh, storage duration is uh, the duration of, of time or uh, when you can access it and it's still valid. Uh, your uh, standard, C++ standard defines four types of storage durations. Uh, you have the static storage duration, which are static variables. Uh, this duration is the entire program lifetime. Um, basically, you can always read and write from it but the object lifetime itself is limited into the storage duration. Um, the sto I didn't say that the storage duration limits the, uh, the object lifetime and it's a property of the, the object. Uh, this is a static storage duration. Automatic storage duration is the local variables, scoped variables, it's the stack. Um, this, uh, this storage is valid once you enter a scope and it becomes invalid once you leave it and reading or writing from to it and from it is invalid once you leave the scope, which uh, causes undefined behavior. Now, the address of these uh, uh, variables is obviously depends on the flow. It's not determined at link time as the static variables. And the, sto the same storage might be reused, but these will be different objects. Dynamic storage duration is the heap. Uh, you can access it using new and delete or malloc and free if you like history. Uh, and it's manually managed in code. Obviously, you have tools like smart pointers and um, con standard containers and other classes which can wrap it, but it's still managed in code and not automatically by the compiler. And, and the address, again, it depends on the flow. And there's thread storage duration, which is not relevant for this uh, talk. Okay, it's going to do this every time, I guess. Yeah, okay. So why do we use dynamic memory locations in the first place? The main reason is the one I said earlier. We just don't know how much memory we need at compile time, so we did defer this decision to, uh, tr to runtime, and we allocate the memory then dynamically. The other reason is we want to separate the allocation initialization context from the actual usage of the object and the object lifetime. For example, if you have a factory method that returns an interface, and the uh, concrete class that is created in the factory method depends on an input or on a system state, you can't uh, know in advance how much memory you're going to need. You're going to need, 
uh, and you can't do it a local, uh, in a local scope of the factory method because this object will be destroyed when you leave it. So you allocate it dynamically on the heap and then return a pointer or reference to it and then you can access it externally. And you can, of course, manage it using a unique pointer or a shared pointer, but you still need the dynamic memory allocation here. Um, okay. Is there another clicker here? Nope. Okay. So before we talk about why not use the heap, let's talk about some properties of phenomena we come across when you use memory, uh, memory in microcontrollers in the embedded system. So we have some context for this discussion. Um, usually embedded systems don't have multiple processes. Everything runs in a single process. It also means that if you have an operating system, you don't always have an operating system, it, tra it runs as part of the process. So you have a single memory address space um, and you can access all of it. You can access the internals of the operating system, you can access whatever, there's no kernel mode and user mode, so every, everything is accessible. Uh, you can define, you should define memory sections manually. You add a linker script uh, to your program which tells the linker uh, which address range uh, it has which properties. Uh, it has, it can be things like uh, this address range should be initialized by zeros, with zeros at, at startup, or this address range should not be touched at startup, so it's uninitialized. And sometimes, sometimes even this address range is from another device. It's not the internal RAM of the CPU, it's an external RAM or a flash driver or an um, internal flash of the CPU. Uh, it all depends on the mapping of the uh, CPU address range uh, to the devices around it and you have to specify it explicitly for the linker. You even define your own stacks memory area. Assuming you have a multi-threaded operating system, whenever you create a uh, thread, you declare, define a static array of characters and pass it as the stack area for the thread. And you can even define the memory locations of uh, selected data items, variables. You can tell them that they're in a certain memory section and, if, and sometimes you even need to tell them that you're, they're in a certain address in memory. So all this sums up to a very high level of control that you want to achieve when using memory on microcontrollers. And this coupled with the usually limit, very limited RAM size uh, uh, causes us problems in using the heap. Uh, RAM, just for reference, can start move from uh, the, the low end a few kilobytes through tens and thousands, tens and hundreds of uh, kilobytes of RAM. Uh, in the upper end, uh, high level, you have high end, you have a few megabytes of RAM. So it's not that uh, small, but uh, compared to modern PCs, modern servers, even your mobile phones, it's really nothing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So what kind of problems are we facing when you use the heap? Uh, we can define four problem categories. You have a problem of no determinism. We said we need high level of control over the memory. But uh, as we said, the address and memory addresses uh, are de highly depend on the flow and on the um, um, algorithm used for heap allocation. So all of these uh, kind of hurt the purpose of high level of control because sometimes we want to know the data addresses in advance. It can cause memory fragmentation, uh, which is a big problem when you have low, CPU, low uh, RAM size. Uh, it can cause random failures and this is a two-parter because uh, you, because of the low size of memory, you increase the chances of runtime failures when you allocate. And in embedded systems, it's harder to um, recover from runtime failures. Don't have uh, an operating system you know, because you crash the operating system or uh, the operating system will not have enough memory or whatever. Uh, so we don't want memory related runtime failures in embedded systems. And it can cause runtime performance depending on the algorithm. And I said we won't talk about memory pools, so I won't talk about them, I just mentioned them. And uh, me memory pools are a very good solution, but to a different problem, not the, the problem I mentioned earlier, but the problems I'm going to talk about soon. And they might solve fragmentation, they might solve runtime performance if you design correctly, if you use a free list, for example. Um, but they don't solve your determinism, they don't solve runtime failures if you 
uh, allocated, pre-allocated 10 item, uh, allocation for 10 items, and suddenly your flow reaches the 11th allocation, you're still in the same problem. So I won't go in there. Okay, what does the standard give us about it? Not much, actually. If you want to refrain from using the heap, you can't rely much on the standard. There are two classes that the standard uh, um, guarantees there are no me dynamic memory allocations there, optional and variant. In both of them, the standard guarantees that the value stored within the object is stored within the storage of the object, and op implementations are not permitted to use additional storage such as dynamic memory. But other than that, not much. You have a std array, which is equivalent to a C style array. Uh, you have uh, sometimes the standard encourages the library developers uh, to try and not use dynamic memory allocation, for example, in st standard function. But there's nothing that guarantees uh, in other classes or in algorithms. There's no algorithm that is guaranteed not to use dynamic memory allocation. Obviously, most of implementations can prevent it, but you can't, you're not guaranteed. Um, so, okay, so let's uh, get into some of the use cases. Okay, first use case. Question? Yeah. Oh, I forgot to say, uh, ask questions. Okay, it's a not very big classroom. Uh, okay, it's a very simple use case. You have a global application object because you write object-oriented code, obviously. Um, so you have a value semantic, you put a local uh, application object, uh, you wrap your entire application in a, in a single object, you put it on the local in your main and you run it, it's on the stack, everything works fine. What's the problem with it? What's the constructor? What's it's my, my application, it, it will not do any dynamic memory allocations inside. Stack size, right. What we get if we run this and it's too big? Stack overflow. Okay, next best thing. Heap, if we have, uh, if we can use the heap, we just uh, uh, dynamically allocate it, we do a unique pointer and then run it and everything's fine, it will be destroyed and uh, released uh, at the end. But we don't have dynamic memory allocation, so uh, we want to do something, we store it, so we want to store it somewhere and then run it. Where can you store it? So again, we want to have a different storage. We want to separate the storage duration from the object lifetime. So the storage will have static duration, be initialized dynamically. What can we do here? Something very simple. Static in the function, local static. Uh, it's a static, so the uh, lifetime duration of the entire program. Uh, storage duration of the um, entire program life. So it will never be released until the end and it's not on the stack, everything's fine, yeah? I mean, because of the threading issue of accessing it? Well, only... Yeah, but it only happens if you do it in a function which you access a lot. If you access it only once, like in main or a global scope, then you only reach it once, so it doesn't... Yeah. yeah. Don't pre-optimize. What? Just show up where? Oh, maybe not. If it's a local static, with a with maybe not not that. Okay. Okay. So it's a good solution, except it's sometimes too simple, too static. What if we want our uh, application to support two hardware generations? The second hardware was added two ports. Now we want to have uh, another constructor which receives three ports, not only one. And we still want to have it in constructor because we, we could have added an init function which receives three ports and another init function which receives a single port. And then uh, we would have a, a big application object which is in unknown state at the beginning and not initialized. We want to keep it uh, straight and we don't want to mess our business code, business logic with some memory problems. What's the problem with this? Two instances and their memory will be allocated for both instances. And we don't want that obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here. So we want to do something like this. Okay, we want to have some kind of lazy application. It's still static, 
yeah, but only a single one. And the constructor will be called when you call construct. It's not really constructed before that. Okay, everyone sees why it's a solution for it, our problem? Where? I, I, this is specifically a problem of a, a single application that you want to run. Sure, a loop might complicate things, but then you'll have other, that's, you know what, this is the problem of a container of unknown size, because you, if you know how many times the loop will run, you can pre-allocate it. If you don't know, it's the same problem, and we're, we're not going to talk about it, okay? So how can we implement this? Uh, let's see what tools the language provides us with. C++ 11 added STD aligned storage. STD aligned storage is actually, it defines an uninitialized storage type. Uh, uninitialized storage means that it has no object in it, but it's a valid uh, memory to write into and read from. Um, and it receives two temp parameters, the length, the size, and the alignment. And the buffer, the type here, which is defined inside, is guaranteed to be good enough, to be big enough, to be properly aligned, to store within it an object of this size and alignment. Okay, the actual size and alignment of the type here are implementation defined and they are indeed different, in, at least for small objects uh, in each of the three major compilers. Uh, but f definitely for our big application, this is good enough, a few more bytes won't matter, hopefully. And it says C++, C++ 14 gave us the shortened uh, uh, underscore T, which uh, can reduce the other four bytes, the scope type. Okay. And if we mentioned memory alignment, just a few words on it, about it. Uh, memory alignment in C++, uh, each type in C++ has a requirement for alignment, depends on the hardware for which you compile to. Uh, the alignment is always a power of two, so if you have two different alignments, the larger one is always good enough for objects of the small alignment. And compilers will generally take care of that for you. If there's a local variable, they will, it will be properly aligned. If there's a member, a member in a class, uh, it will add padding if it ne if needs to be. Uh, so it's properly aligned when you use it, unless you mess with it, like Pragmapec. Uh, anyone used Pragmapec before? Okay, for communication compression, for example. So this messes with it, and then you have to take care of it yourself. But other than that, the compilers uh, are okay with it. And C++11 added two keywords related to alignment, the align of and the line of, there was a question there? Okay, yeah. Because if you have, uh, what, what you're saying that most types, uh, if their size is small, then the alignment requirement is small? Oh, because... Because the character array might not be properly aligned because characters don't have a big enough alignment requirement. If you have, for example, UIN 64, 64-bit, uh, it usually has to be aligned to an 8-byte boundary, uh, on an 8-byte boundary. You see this uh, image of int32 on 4-byte boundary? And so the character array can start at just three, and if you start create an object there, it won't be properly aligned. Okay. Uh, so C++ 11 added two keywords: align of and align as. Align of is basically the same as size of for alignment requirement of a type, and the line as allows you to define a type or a variable which is aligned as a certain number. Um, and we'll see how it's used in a minute. Um, Okay, if you're in pre C++11, anyone here is pre C++11? Okay, one. I used to be in part of my projects not uh, just about a few months ago. You too? Okay, so if you still want an uh, aligned storage, you can do this. From uh, It's not optimal, but for the most part it works, especially on embedded systems because the alignment here is uh, okay. Okay. Um, I have some another uh, uh, some other slides just for the two of you. Um, okay, and the next tool the uh, C++ language provides us with is the placement new. Uh, placement operator new has uh, quite a few overloads, and you can add overloads of your own. But this is a built-in one, uh, which can uh, used to be used to construct an object for an, in an uninitialized storage, as the one we just saw, without allocating memory. Okay, for, for example, we have a struct A, 
okay, to some kind of a type, we can define a buffer uh, which is properly sized and properly aligned. See, this is how we use the align a, align as. Um, and then we can construct in place, use the placement new operator, um, a uh, object of type A inside this buffer. This is the syntax, new of buffer. This is the void pointer address in which we want to, to construct our object. And the A and the argu uh, constructor arguments if need to be. And it returns an A pointer as if it was a new operator, a normal new operator. Okay? The only difference, it does no allocation. But then, because it's not a local object and we can't call delete on it because delete uh, deallocates memory, we have to explicitly call the destructor at the end, and this is the syntax. Okay? Sorry? You don't know. That's the problem. You don't know where, how it will be aligned. It, it will be aligned to the minimum, requ it could be aligned to the minimum requirement of care character, which is maybe one, maybe, I don't know if it's properly defined, but definitely could be smaller than, than eight. There is a difference between unique pointer and shared pointer, be because I don't remember which one you should provide the deallocator and which one is automatically used to heap. I don't remember. But only the one that you can give a deallocator because otherwise it will try to deallocate the memory and this memory should not be deallocated. Okay? You, you could wrap it in your own class. We'll do it later. But uh, this is just the basic mechanism. Okay? Okay. So this is how we implement our lazy using all these tools. Um, we have the aligned storage. Uh, it's uses the size of n the line of t, our uh, type. Um, then this is the construct uh, function that we used. It uses variadic templates to pass uh, uh, the arguments of the constructor inside. You forward it into the uh, constructor. And you'll know that we use here the uh, placement new on the address of m storage. Okay, m storage is the buffer we want. And then we can just return the object. Uh, we return it by reference, so we dereference the, the pointer. And is there a problem? Could it return a null, null pointer? Question, open question. Could it return a null pointer? I think the answer was no here, right? It can't because there's no actual allocation here. We use the storage that we already have, okay? And to destroy it, again, we call explicitly the destructor. And to access it, we can, this is the get function, we do a reinterpret cast for the storage because we want to treat the area of this memory as if it was a pointer, as if the object is there because we want, we constructed the object there, we know that the data in this address is an object of type T, so we can do this reinterpret cast, okay? There's no static cast that will work here because there's no cast between whatever the type of M storage or uh, pointer is to the type of uh, object, uh, our pointer to our own object. Questions about this, any of this? Yeah. It will take the first byte and that's the whole purpose of reinterpret cast. Reinterpret cast doesn't change the address, it just reinterprets whatever this pointer points to to a pointer of another type. This is the classic use case of reinterpret cast to treat, retreat, to treat a, the, a memory area as another type. So what about the buffer? Is it important that we align it? That's the meaning of a line of T. Because the aligned storage T is Requ requires some kind of alignment, so the compiler will place M storage accordingly. Okay? If you add pragma pick to, pack to all of this, you mess things up. But M storage has a requir alignment requirement which is good enough for T, and that's why the compiler will place it in a correctly aligned position. Okay? Yeah. To 
maybe. <laughs> okay, but uh, I have a slide on that later on about variant and std optional is C17. And who here uses C++ uh, before who is pre C17? Okay. Anyone has an is on an embedded uh, systems? Anyone on embedded systems uses a C++ 17 compiler? I rest my case. <laughs> okay, next use case. Uh, what's the time? Okay, how much time do we have? Okay, 30 more minutes. Okay. The, the compiler will make sure that M storage is always properly aligned, no matter how many you do, how many of these you do. So the size of lazy will, add, the compiler will probably add padding after the boolean here for the next M storage to be properly aligned. Okay. okay. A state machine is a mathematical concept, which is often used in C++ in programming in general. And um, it is used to represent how a, sta a system changes its behavior as a response to events uh, when it changes its internal state. For example, if you have a light and a light switch, the light starts in state off, and you, flip, you get the event of flipping the switch. If the light is in state off, it will turn on the light and will turn, change its internal state to state on. And if the light is in sta state, internal state on, it will, the event of flipping the switch will change its internal state to state off and will turn off the light. Was that clear? Uh, it's a very, very simple state machine, a Boolean state machine actually, but it's a state machine. In the general case, if uh, it's simple enough, you could uh, implement it using switch case on each event. You receive an event, you switch on the sta current state. If the current state is state one, then you do this and switch to state three. If the current state is state two, you do something else and you don't switch to state, just for example. Okay? This is a state machine. Now, as it get more, as the state machine gets more complex, you would want to change your design to something other than a switch case. You have the state design pattern, uh, which means actually that the entire behavior of a state is encapsulated inside a class. Okay, so you have con concrete state A encapsulates all the behavior as a response to all events of state A, and they, all the states, all the states implement a base state, uh, which receives or inherit from a base state, or implement an interface to a state, which can receive all the events. And you have the context object, which manages all of this. And just pass it, it doesn't know, really know which is the current state, just has a pointer to a state and passes the events onto it. Okay? Great. So if we have the hip, oh, and because we don't have much memory, we want, only have one, want to have a single state object at a, at a time. So we don't want, if we have 20 states, we don't want to store all of them in memory. So if we have the hip, we can use this. Uh, this is the base state. These are the five states of the system. Um, accurately named state one to state five. And then we can use them. We can uh, have a unique pointer, which is the current state. It would be a member of the context, but they didn't do the entire state machine implementation here. And the current state can get, uh, uh, can be assigned a make unique of state one, which receives the context of whatever we, ha we are in and can pass the event to a current state. And later on, when we change the state, we can do an, this make unique. It will destroy the previous state and create a new one, okay? But if we don't have the heap, we need a storage, as we said. And uh, Haskell, regarding your question on the optional, same uh, issue with STD variant. And if you do have STD variant for some reason, uh, in some magical way, then think carefully about your initial state because it might not receive uh, arguments for the state, so you need to use monostate. Uh, but we won't get into this. So we want to use aligned storage because we like this class, right? Right? Thank you. Um, okay, so we give it a size of something and a line of something and we create our buffer. What do we put there? Mm, 
max two states. What do you mean by two states? Oh, oh, I get. You might want to have a dual state for a transition. Okay, uh, let's disregard this. You're right, but we will ignore this. Okay, we'll assume that you only want a single state at the same time uh, at every given moment. And we said, yes, uh, we want max. So uh, we can define some kind of a tail recursion uh, template. Yes, maybe we can do it with fold expressions. I don't know fold expressions well enough. Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not relevant here. Um, so we can define. It. It's not really important details. Just know so know that uh, it's possible. You compare the max size of the first uh, uh, argument and uh, all max size of all, all other arguments. This is the edge case. Okay, the size of. Um, and in C plus plus fourteen, you can do this uh, ver uh, template variable uh, to short again shorten the usage of it. And for align, alignment, you can do the same with the line of, okay? And you get all of this. And if, where are the two of you? An extra slide, especially for you. Uh, if you're pre-C++11, you can do this. Just use plenty of void. If you have 20 states, and I had 20 states, um, it's, it'll be longer, but it's doable, okay? Here and here. Okay. So we have this max size V and max align V, which we defined outside of the presentation. And now we can define some kind of a generic hierarchy factory. We call it a factory because it creates uh, classes, creates states. We call it hierarchy because basically all the classes we want to create here are derived from the base class we give it. And we call it generic because it's generic. And it's templated on the base class, which is the base state in our case and a list of all the possible states we want to have in this uh, factory, okay? And then we define our st uh, line storage uh, as the max size and max align of the derived classes, okay? And the line storage is good enough for all the states derived class, okay? So we can use it. Let's continue. Uh, this is our class. Uh, we have a, uh, above the line storage. The construct uh, function um, receives as a template parameter the concrete class we want to uh, create, the derived class, and all the uh, construction arguments we want to pass to the constructor. And we want to return the base class reference because outside of it, although we uh, explicitly stated we want to create state three, yeah, we still only care about receiving a reference to a state, uh, an abstract state, because this is what the state machine uh, cares about. And then, this is one of the most important things you'll, uh, I hope you take from this uh, talk. Always, when you mess with thi these things, always a static assert. Static assert on the uh, size of the derived class, on the alignment of the derived class. Make sure they're properly, they're uh, good enough for, the buffer is good enough for them, because when you add, just let me finish the sentence, uh, when you add uh, your next state, you will forget to add it to the list. When you add the next state, three months later, you will forget to add it to the list. If it's uh, small enough and the alignment requirement is small enough, you won't care. But if it's not, you have to cache it here, otherwise you'll have memory overruns uh, and you won't know where it came from. Yeah. I won't, don't need a static assert because I will get a compiler error here if it's not. Okay, unless they're convertible from one to another, but I don't really, really care. It's the problem of whoever sent it. This is, a, yeah. But you can, you're right. Uh, it's a, you can add it. Uh, there's a, is a base class, right? Something like that. Is base? I don't remember. Okay. So this is the placement new. Um, we give it the buffer, a buffer pointer, and then the derived the, the same as before, just to see that we are on the same page. What's uh, the type of created object here? Pointer to derived, right? Okay. And then we static cast it into the uh, base class and return uh, a dereference to it. The two semi where? Uh, just to make sure no one overloaded the operator new for 
in this scope, or well, whatever. I don't know, when you mess these things, uh, you get hurt once, you always add this. M maybe it's not needed, but, uh, okay. Okay, and then we want to be able, yeah, okay, to destroy this object. So when we get the destruct, uh, uh, we, we, when uh, someone calls the destruct function, we check if we have a current object, we call the destructor, and we nullify it, so uh, we're clean. Okay, any questions? It's an inheritance, uh, it's a hierarchy, so I hope the whoever did it, uh, had, uh, the virtual, uh, it's his problem, let's say. It. it has to be virtual, yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Why do I do this? Why do we need to store the base class pointer here? Why not just do it like we did before, the reinterpret cast for the, to, from the storage to the base class and call it the, uh, the destructor of the base class? Assume we have a V table pointer because it's inheritance to hmm? because of multiple inheritance. Yeah. If you have if you inherit from two classes which have virtual tables, you will have two virtual pointers at the start of your object. And if by chance your this base class is the second one in the inheritance list, then the address of let's go back there. The address of current object and created object will not be the same address. Okay, so you, if you reinterpret cast, then you break something. Okay? Great. Okay, so, and this is how we use it. Uh, we have a generic factory here uh, of base state and states one to five. We can construct state one and then destruct it and obviously pass events if we need to and then we construct another state with arguments and then destruct it as well okay questions for use case two great who here uses std function we here doesn't use std function if you want to store in class as a member class thank you no not as an argument to pass somewhere, but if you need to store it. Okay. Why do you st use it? That's type erasure. Okay, what is type erasure? Type erasure means you hide the type inside another type. Uh, STD function as an example, you can put um, uh, virtually infinite, infinite types uh, into it. You can uh, put a function pointer, you can uh, put a member to function pointer, a function object which has the call operator, any lambda, which is a different type each. Everything is, can be pushed there. And once you pass the uh, object, uh, the function object around, no one has to know about it. it. You just pass the function object, not templated on anything. A counterexample is variant. You can store uh, quite a few, uh, any type into it if you define it. But when you pass it around, it has to be defined with the possible types which are inside it, so the type is not erased. Okay? Great. Type erasure comes at a cost. A virtual function is a really minor cost, but it is a cost. Code size is more of a problem, uh, especially on embedded systems. You can sometimes only use a function which is specifically for a member function, so you only template on the a uh, type and not a function, so you don't have to do the entire type erasure. And there are libraries that do that. But let's say we want a full type erasure, okay? Uh, okay, so let's define our problem. We want uh, to have a function object, uh, which is type erased. Uh, the input will be a maximum size and alignment, as we already seen, okay? Because we don't want it to have unlimited size. We can't have it unlimited size. It should wrap any callable type, and if the callable is too big, it should fail at compile time. Okay? Great. So, assuming we had the heap, how could we implement a type erasure for this? Let's start with this and then move on to the storage version. Um, this is our uh, template uh, class, the function template class, too many overloaded words. Uh, in the, there's a single uh, template argument here, the function signature, and then we specialize on it to split it to the return type and the arguments. Okay, this is how we do it. 
And once we have this, we can use the return type separately and the argument separately. Internally, we define a call the interface. The interface which will allow us to hide callable types inside the function. Um, you have the virtual destructor for you, Haskell, and the virtual, and the virtual call function, which is actually basically the same function signature that the function object needs. And then this is the trick for type erasure. You have an impulse struct which implements this interface and is templated on the actual type that you're going to hide or erase inside this class. Okay? You store, uh, this is templated on it. You store a copy of it inside the, this impulse. And then the call function, the virtual call which implements the interface, simply forwards the arguments to the call operator of the uh, mcoli. Okay? And how can we use it? We have a unique pointer. Remember, still the heap-based uh, solution. We have a unique pointer uh, held in the class. In the constructor or the assignment operator, we just do a make unique on input of the callie type that we received. At this point, we know the exact type that we want to erase. Okay, this is when you do f equals uh, lambda or something, or you pass a lambda into a function that receives an STD function or whatever. This, at this point, you know the type, so you can do this. You, have, you know the callie type. And then when you use it, you don't need to know the callie type anymore because it's impl uh, it implements the interface and you only need access to the interface. Okay? And this is how you call it, call it and you basically hit the, the type. It's erased. Okay, great. Um, that was really super simplified. Uh, it's missing a lot of things. If you want to copy the function object, you need some kind of clone here. If you want to destroy it, you need some kind of I don't know, destructor or whatever. No, destructor will be handled, but it, it's missing a lot of things. If you look at, uh, I don't know, STD function implementation in whatever uh, standard library you like, and hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, um, so the, uh, use, just use the function if you want to use this. Um, so, okay, so for the storage-based version, we need some kind of storage for unlimited types because we said we can't limit it for, uh, for specific types because the lambda can be any type. So we want to de define some kind of an any storage which receives size and alignments, any, because there's any type. Um, so it's, again, it's templated on size and alignment. Uh, it will have an aligned storage uh, with the size that requires size and alignment. And then we want to be able to destroy this function, to destroy this type. So we define the structure function and we store it. The structure function is just a function that receives a void pointer, okay, of whatever we want to uh, destroy. We'll use it in a, in a moment. Uh, in the construct, uh, the construct function is the same as before. Uh, receive the arguments, uh, static asserts, don't forget them. Uh, we destruct the object uh, internally, so we, if we as are assigned with a new object, we can destroy the, uh, destroy the first one first. We do the placement new as before. Um, and then we store a destructor function. Okay, we locally uh, define it here, a lambda function. At this point, we do know the t, okay, because we're in construct, so we can do this. Explicitly, we, we interpret cast t pointer uh, of the buffer, or the storage, uh, the pointer we received here in the destructor function, and then call the destructor, okay? And then we can store this function. And now this function knows how to destroy a t, okay? We store it, and then we return the object, and we're done once the presentation continues. Okay. So, and then we went, when we want to destroy the object, we call destruct, and we have a destructor function, and we just call it with a storage pointer. Okay? Questions so far? Great. Um, okay, so how do we use it? we can define some kind of an in-place function object, um, and uh, which is, again, templated on the function signature and size and alignment, and then we specialize it on 
uh, return type and arguments to split them up. And then we have any storage instead of the aligned storage we had before. And we, sorry, we have uh, instead of unique pointer for the interface, we just hold a pointer for the interface. And then the only difference, and uh, we have the interface, and uh, the call interface and the call impl as we had before, the templated impl. And the only in, uh, difference here is instead of calling make unique, we call m storage construct with the impl call type, the same as before. And this works, it magically works. The same, we hit the type, okay? The type is erased and we can use it. And if the type is too big, then the static assert of any storage here will not compile. Here? No, sorry. Construct here will not compile because the static asserts inside the construct. Okay? Great. So, um, again, don't reinvent the wheel. There's an already invented wheel. Uh, SG14, the study group 14 of subgroup 14, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, of the standards committee. Uh, it's the group of the low latency embedded programming, game development, uh, high frequency trading. They have a GitHub with uh, many utilities. One of them is in place function. I took the name from there. They have a much more robust uh, implementation. I don't know how production ready it is, but it sure was written by people that are much smarter and much more experienced than I am. So you should check it out. And by the way, they did not use aligned storage. They wrote their own aligned storage because of the problem of implementation defined size and alignment per compiler. Okay. Questions for use case three? Great. You still awake? Okay. Use case four, something that we want to do a lot, uh, multi-client event. We raise an event and we want many people to listen to it. The Eurovision, the C++ core conference. We have a service class that can raise an event. We want multiple client classes the, to register to this event. And we don't want the service to know the clients or how many other in advance. Okay, we have the service in the middle, we have the four clients around it. So let's, we have actually two flavors for this problem. We have the asynchronous and the synchronous flavors. I don't mean anything thread related when I say asynchronous. What I mean is that asynchronous, that it's not necessary that when the event happens, something, the client will do something immediately. This client will handle this event when it wants to, when this, uh, its next cycle comes. I usually assume cycle-based uh, design here. You have uh, you go through all your local modules and managers, and you update each and every one of them. The number module number three raises an event. Module number six, when it uh, its cycle reaches, or the module number two, when the next cycle reaches, will handle this event. Okay, synchronous is just callbacks. So uh, th that's what I said. Uh, basically, and we define some kind of observers. An observer design pattern is synchronous, so we'll call them async observers. We want to define some kind of async observer. So this is the interface we want. We have an okay event E, we can trigger it. We can uh, uh, define async observers, O1, observer 1 and observer 2, that both register E, and we want, uh, if we ask O1 and O2 was the event triggered, they say no, because since they were constructed and registered the event, the event did not trigger. Then we can trigger the event once, twice, ten times, it doesn't really matter. matter. And then we ask O1, was the event triggered? Yes. Uh, we can reset the event, and O1 says the event was not triggered because we reset it. But we want the um, uh, observers to be independent, which means if we now go and ask observer 2, was the event triggered? It will say yes. So we can have different cycles for different observers at different uh, rates, and each and every one of them will, will see that the event has happened. Okay? Um, something a little more concrete. We have a calculator, which depends on some configuration. And uh, we have a configuration manager, which uh, uh, provides an observer for this uh, event. And uh, construct in the constructor, uh, the calculator can register can hold the config change uh, observer locally. It can register for the configuration manager uh, for the configuration change. And on its update cycle, okay, on its update cycle, it can ask was the event triggered, 
and then it can even get the, the data itself. It's an event with data to update the parameters and reset the event, and it's independent from other clients. Okay, so we don't need really need to hold the list of all the clients, and each observer just uh, points at an event. I see I only have five minutes, so I'll hurry up. Um, and uh, each observer holds a, a reference to the event. Uh, we have a base event. Uh, the way we do the independent independency between the, uh, the different observers is using a counter. Each event has a counter, and each observer stores its the last counter it saw, okay? And then uh, you can uh, just check that the counter has changed and see that the event has happened since the last time you checked it. You don't reset anything on the event. Re the observer resets the counter locally. So basically, we have two types of event, an event with data and an event with no data. I'll just skip it because I want to reach some other things. Okay, event can have data or void, which has no data. And the async observer is also very simple. Just hold the, the counter and the event. And you can reset the event by taking the current counter and assigning it to your local uh, counter. Please, if you still have questions, hold me. I'm running a little fast here. And uh, what event trigger just checks if the counter has changed. And this is just so we can have both data event and non-data event in the observers. OK, this is uh, an able if. I'm sure there are better ways to do it. Uh, but uh, this means that it will, this function will not exist if there is no data, if data is void. OK? OK. The more interesting, I think, um, flavor is the synchronous flavor, the callbacks. If we have heap, the heap, we just create a vector and hold all the callbacks, right? It's a no-brainer. C Sharp has it. Many languages have it. JavaScript has it. Just register a list of events on a callback, uh, or a list of callbacks on an event, sorry. Um, but since we don't have it, we're going to need a storage issue. And you'll note that this is a, a container of unknown size that I said we won't talk about. But this is a special case of container of unknown size because it's unknown size at uh, compile time. A compile time size is unknown locally in the service class. But globally, if you look at our entire code base, and even if you include libraries that you use, the size is known. You have storage in your code. So you can do something like that. You can do a distributed list distributed list that runs linked list that runs through your code from one client to another uh, and go over it without allocating a single byte. Okay? Is the concept clear? Great. So how can we implement this? Anyone did not implement here linked list ever? Great. That, then you know how to implement this. You have a service, this is the interface, event callback type, register callback you get the callback type, which is actually a node in the our list. Uh, send data is the trigger of the event. This is how you implement the client. You take the, uh, you define locally the node. This is very important, okay? Because this is your storage. We had a storage problem. This is the storage. It's local in the client. It's part of the client storage. And no matter how many clients you have, each one has its own storage defined with its node. It's the event callback type, and then on. For example, when you want to uh, register it, you can assign a callback to the, this node, and then you can register it to the service. Okay, and the list and node callbacks, callback list and callback node are just a linked list uh, with pointers. Okay, uh, the node holds the callback type, which is function, in place function, whatever. Uh, it has two func imp three important functions: the link, which unlinks a previous list if there exists one, uh, stores the list and requests the list to add it to its end, unlink, which removes it and nullify everything, and trigger the event, which calls the callback. Okay? And the list itself is very simple. Uh, there's a trigger that just goes over the entire linked list, and everything else is private, and node is a friend, so only the node can add itself to the list. Maybe there are other design alternatives here, but it's good enough. And to use it, if you have a service, you can uh, define a callback type in place function, for example, and the list and node that we saw, you hold the list, 
you have the register callback from the interface, which just receives the node and calls the link with its internal list. And when you send that, I just trigger the event on the list. Any questions on this use case? I ran a little fast, but um, I hope it's okay. Great. So to sum up, to avoid dynamic memory locations, use static instead of automatic uh, storage. Use STD aligned storage, except where you actually care about the extra bytes, in which case maybe write your own or take someone else's. Uh, use the compile time size calculation if you know the types at compile time. Uh, to get type erasure, you should specify the maximum size and alignment. Always check static assert that the uh, size and alignment are correct. Uh, if you want to f write a function pointer, don't write a function pointer, uh, function, function wrapper, sorry. Use an existing solution. And even if it's a container of unknown size locally, you might know it the size globally. For example, a distributed list of callbacks to take advantage of this. And that's it. Any questions? Thank you.